In this video, I will talk about uh, industrial scale fabrication as compared to the last lecture on the topic. This time we will discuss methods that can be used uh, for mass production of uh, microfluidic lab on a chip type devices. First thing uh, we talk about is uh, hot embossing and we focus solely on polymers in this video. Second one will be injection molding. So um, first of all to, to place things in context uh, we start by speaking of the traditional flow chemistry setups which I consider this in my slideshow something like I show here so benched up instruments of uh, various sorts um, since uh, microfluidics and lab on a chip and uh, to a large ex extent biomems itself grew out of uh, uh, high performance liquid chromatography that is typically performed in um, such bench top uh, instruments uh, also connected with uh, tubing that uh, that is the same kind we use in in lab on a chip and in microfluidics and um, so it's uh, for professional analytical laboratories uh, or for medical diagnostics can also be uh, a place where uh, such analytical instrumentation can be used uh, but then that is not high performance liquid chromatography anymore uh, anyway uh, if we talk about benchtop instrumentation and if we talk about flow chemistry then uh, typically think about uh, such benchtop instruments that uh, are uniform in uh, one dimension so you have here one unit another unit and the third unit you can uh, put them next to each other you might even stack them and build your setup uh, the target is uh, high precision or uh, lower uh, cost of, uh, of a single uh, workflow or single process or whatever that workflow is and uh, yeah means instrumentation is expensive but if we talk about uh, medical diagnostics then uh, processing one sample is cheap or if we talk about uh, another uh, bioanalytical uh, application then uh, testing one sample is cheap instrument is expensive and you need professional personnel the second type is already a higher level of integration and this will be part of our course the cartridge and reader type of setups and now we talk about uh, commercial applications so this one is already lab on a chip in a way the cartridge itself being the microfluidic component and then you have a reader that can range in size from a benchtop instrument to something handheld like uh, shown down here this is a handheld instrument with wireless communication its own uh, power supply but uh, you still replace the cartridge after each use and uh, if we talk about medical diagnostics then uh, this would already fall into the point of care uh, field and the target is that more people can access it instrumentation is uh, in the mid-range uh, in terms of cost and uh, also the per sample uh, test cost is, uh, is in the mid-range uh, so a couple hundred to a couple thousand and from uh, dozens to a hundred um, then third one would be fully integrated systems which is your true lab on a chip where you have all of the functions from sample collection to result output in a single device this also may or may not have a, a microfluidic cartridge the microfluidics may be part of the device in an integrated format um, one example that i bring you is uh, a device that i myself uh, worked on it's um, a handheld diagnostic device which uh, is single use disposable for uh, detecting uh, dna of uh, chlamydia and gonorrhea originally 
It's also applicable in home care. And uh, the, the target would be the widest possible uh, availability at homes and uh, in offices and in small clinics and so on. Uh, the instrument is relatively cheap, 20 to 50 euros uh, per device, but that also means uh, one test costs significantly more than uh, in this case. Uh, we have uh, seen this diagram before, but um, I would like to again emphasize that uh, in industrial scale production, once you are there, if you make a mistake, that's really difficult to correct. That is why in this course, I give you these tools. If you ever start in the industry, then um, you will be able to do rapid prototyping and you will be able to do simulations uh, more easily than, uh, than without such knowledge. And uh, then you will be able to, uh, to build and test and iterate your design before you start producing and before things become really expensive. Uh, we have spoken about polymers before, so I'm not going to repeat uh, the, the same uh, statements, only that plastics are particularly well suited for uh, single-use rapid tests and, and for massive uh, amounts of, uh, of goods produced. And part, that's part of the, or part of the reason for that is that uh, it's done anyway. The general consumer goods are all uh, produced from plastics. And uh, so there's a lot of experience and a lot of uh, different facilities that can do it for you. That means because of the competition, cost is quite low. However, uh, it's still not uh, trivial because you need molds and the molds themselves uh, are quite costly. Uh, you have different choices. But uh, in terms of materials, uh, two very common, not most common, but very common materials used in, um, in level and chip and microfluidics uh, are PMMA, so polymethyl methacrylate, also known as acrylic glass, and uh, olefin copolymers, COC being the most uh, common. There's also polycarbonate, and uh, well, as a structural material for device uh, enclosures and so on. People usually use uh, polycarbonate, ABS, copolymers and, uh, and the like. But uh, for making chips, these are uh, quite, quite uh, common because of their transparency and uh, their good uh, chemical resistance. Oops. And uh, yeah, the PMMA is often used for hot embossing and also milling, and uh, COC is often used for injection molding. Uh, this is one catalog example for a COC chip. This is another catalog example for a hot embossed uh, PMMA chip. This one is injection molded. Um, so first, uh, let's talk about uh, hot embossing, which is also referred to as microthermoforming. And uh, this is the process of uh, forming heated plastic sheets to a specific shape using a mold. The mold being uh, something made of metal, being the positive of the thing that you want to produce. And on a side note, this is used in consumer goods production quite often. It's how they make uh, ABS uh, luggages, for instance, that is also done by uh, thermoforming. So the mold itself is made of metal. It uh, can be milled or machined in another way. And, um, and there is vacuum suction applied and your heated plastic substrate comes from above and it's just pressed onto your form and uh, the vacuum uh, draws it in. And that's how it takes your shape. Then it cools down and, uh, and there you go, you have your, uh, your design stamped into the polymer and then final result looks like this. You obviously need uh, an opposite layer to seal your chip. 
and uh, that can be different things it can be a laminated uh, foil or usually it is a laminated foil but it can also be another uh, plastic layer that that you just uh, weld onto your uh, design if you want to see thermoforming then uh, go to this link and uh, and this one also so in this case the input is a patterned positive mold and the output is uh, your pattern plastic sheet or polymer layer. Um, a special case of uh, thermoforming would be thermoplastic nanoimprint lithography, or just nanoimprint lithography as uh, many people refer to it. Uh, in this case, uh, hot embossing happens on the nanoscale or microscale. Uh, nanoscale would be more appropriate, but um, the, the mold is typically made out of uh, silicon with uh, microfabrication rather than a metal. So regular thermoforming happens with a metal, uh, nanoimprint lithography happens with uh, a silicon master micro machine. Then uh, let's move on to injection molding. So this one would be your go-to choice if you wanted to produce millions of devices. This being uh, one example, the M chip. Uh, we will talk about it later. It's uh, clearly visible that uh, it's an injection molded chip just by looking at it. Uh, it can be produced in massive quantities, but the mold is expensive. So to make a, a mold for injection molding, um, if you make an aluminum mold, around 10,000 euros, and you can make around 10,000 parts before it wears out. Uh, if you want to make large amounts, then you need a stainless steel mold that runs around 100,000 euros. And uh, that will be enough to produce a million or multiple millions of parts. Uh, still, molds need to be maintained. And so you need uh, expertise of, uh, of skilled uh, personnel to operate it. But how it happens is, uh, you form a material by injecting at high temperature and high pressure uh, into a mold cavity. And the mold cavity is uh, the negative of uh, the part that you want to produce. The plastic source or the source material or the, the polymer that uh, you use comes in the form of pellets. And uh, these pellets are heated up and fed at high pressure through a nozzle, uh, P marking the, the pressure, and uh, then um, through what is called a sprue, it goes into your uh, cavities. In this case, uh, there are two parts being produced at once, and there's uh, uh, something called a runner in between uh, these two cavities. And when they are filled up at high temperature, uh, high pressure, then um, the material fills out the cavity, then the mold is cooled down and uh, the part shrinks. And these pins eject the completed part after which it cools even further and solidifies completely. And uh, there, there you have it, the, the final piece. You can watch a video here on uh, how it's made. And uh, the mold itself is uh, machined from metal um, as I said, uh, for lower quantities, aluminium is used. For higher quantities, for mass production, uh, stainless steel is used. And, uh, well, this mold is uh, the, the key component uh, of your uh, process. And, uh, and it is uh, where you have your design, but it is not the only thing. You need the injection molded uh, machine which also has a cost, you need persons uh, to operate it and so on. So it, it makes most uh, sense to use in mass production. Aluminium molds uh, can be used uh, for testing in uh, small series. And um, it's a good idea to start with that because uh, then the knowledge can be directly converted to uh, a steel mold for mass production. It is not suitable for prototyping at all. So making a mold for hot embossing is uh, still somewhat lower cost 
than making one for injection molding. So be sure that you do the right thing, you have the right design by the time you move to injection molding. Otherwise, um, you will have runaway costs very quickly. The input here is a machined metal mold and the output is your injection molded plastic part. Um, it's a bit difficult to quantify exactly how much each of these things cost, so I'm just going to uh, make a, an approximation to uh, illustrate how it works. Uh, with milling, you have no mold, so there's no cost. Uh, one part milled would cost you uh, 10 to 100 euros if you find the right place. Milling is good for prototyping, uh, but also you can uh, make small scale production. We talked about milling uh, in a previous lecture, so look it up if you need. Uh, you can make multi layer structures, and uh, the minimum feature size that you can achieve is around uh, two and a half microns. Um, this depends heavily on the skills and the machine and uh, depends also on the drill bit that is available has uh, something to do with the materials too but uh, since we're working in soft polymers uh, this is what uh, can be achieved at best uh, hot embossing it's uh, somewhat difficult to estimate the, the mold cost I could not find any uh, publicly available figure and i myself have never uh, used hot embossing personally but uh, the cost is uh, somewhere in between the extremes. So milling being the most expensive, injection molding being the least expensive. This is somewhere in the middle. Um, hot embossing is best applied uh, to prototyping, but can also be applied uh, to production. And especially if we talk about uh, nano imprint lithography, it can be applied to uh, high resolution uh, prototyping and production because it can go down under 100 nanometers uh, with the help of nano imprint lithography and again best suited for multi-layer structures multi-layer being uh, or meaning different types of layers so polymer and glass or silicon and no not silicon but uh, polymer and glass polymer and silicon and so on uh, injection molding uh, as I said, uh, the mold costs between 10,000 and 100,000, but one part can uh, cost as low as one euro or even less. And now we are talking about complex uh, structures. So basically, once you are producing, you only need to pay for the source material, uh, the maintenance of the mold and uh, the personnel operating it and it just runs and runs and runs 24 seven. Um, it's only good for production. And this saying that it is monolithic and is not entirely correct. Um, it's monolithic in the sense that uh, it always has to be a sandwich of polymers that uh, you join somehow. Uh, typically in the industry, it would be a solid plastic uh, for the substrate with the channels or for the body of the chip and the foil to laminate uh, a laminated foil to uh, close the channels and uh, Resolution can be down to 50 to 100 nanometers. I have to say here that uh, It uh, can also be done in a way that you attach um, a silicon mold and uh, make injection molding on this so same as how hot embossing can be done with a silicon master, the injection molding can also be done with a silicon mold. Uh, it is just a bit more tricky and uh, the silicon itself uh, doesn't last very long, obviously under pressure. So uh, in this slide, we talked about uh, two methods of uh, industrial scale fabrication, hot embossing and injection molding and uh, what it means in terms of uh, of industrial fabrication.